So to begin, what is the role of the artist in society? This question consumed Kate Kolwitz, a German printmaker, sculptor, teacher, and social activist who used her work to oppose war and social injustice. And she is the subject of the Benton's exhibition, Kate Kolwitz, Activism Through Art. So following are some installation views to get us started. Uh, this is the title wall, which we'll return to in a moment. So born in 1867, Kolwitz lived through three tumultuous political regimes, the German Empire, the Weimar Republic, and the Third Reich. And she died before the end of World War II in 1945. She portrayed the anguish caused by war and herself suffered numerous losses, including the death of her youngest son in World War I and her grandson in World War II. She once wrote, it is my duty to voice the sufferings of men, the never ending sufferings heaped mountain high. This is my task, but it is not an easy one. Kolwitz was born in the Prussian city of Königsberg, now Kaliningrad, Russia, to a progressive family and studied art in Berlin and Munich. She married Karl Kolwitz, a physician, and the couple moved to Berlin in 1891. The working class women and children who visited her husband's clinic became Kolwitz's favorite subjects, along with her two sons, Hans, born in 1892, and Peter, born in 1896. And Kolwitz also made numerous self-portraits like this one throughout her life. Um, and they're really notable for how sort of unflinchingly honest they are. Um, and also sort of notable for um, almost never showing her as looking particularly uh, happy. She looks very serious um, as in this example from 1919. So really determined uh, artist. Trained as a painter, Kolwitz turned to printmaking to make her work more widely accessible. In 1897, she completed her first print cycle, the one that really launched her to fame, a weaver's revolt, which established her reputation not only as a skilled artist, but also as an advocate for the downtrodden. Kolwitz based the series on an 1844 uprising of weavers against poverty and oppression in the Prussian province of Silesia, a center of textile manufacturing. The subject was considered subversive enough that Kaiser Wilhelm II prevented her from receiving a gold medal for the cycle at the Berlin Salon in 1898. Nevertheless, Kolwitz's reputation grew in the following decades, and she became the first woman elected a member of the Prussian Academy of Arts in 1919. So we are looking at the second sheet in a weaver's revolt. Death shows a family of three gathered around a table in a dark cramped room. The child at the center of the image stares listlessly at a candle as a fourth figure, a skeleton, reaches out to touch the arm of a dying woman. So this combination of naturalism and symbolism the human figures that we see, and then that skeleton symbolizing uh, death. Um, these are in this, the same image and they clearly communicate the stark consequences of poverty and hunger that the weavers rose up to combat. 
And Kolwitz chose to represent the weavers in workers' clothing. And by doing that, she's connecting the 1844 uprising that inspired her series with more contemporary social problems. Kolwitz labored tirelessly to perfect her craft and worked primarily in etching and lithography before taking up woodcut in 1920. The rawness of woodcut, a printmaking technique in which the artist carves an image into the surface of a block of wood, helped Kolwitz Kolwitz express the anguish she felt in the wake of World War I and to convey the deprivation it caused. This exhibition presents both of the artist's woodcut cycles, war, begun in 1918 and completed in 1923, and proletariat, which she worked on between 1924 and 1925. Kolwitz became more politically active during the 1920s, designing leaflets and posters for progressive causes. The exhibition features examples of her more overtly political work, which brought her art directly to the streets. The urgency of Kolwitz's work between 1919 and 1925 reflects the dire conditions in Weimar Germany after World War I, when economic hyperinflation caused widespread unemployment, suffering, and starvation. And so we're looking at the last two prints on the exhibition's title wall. Kolwitz adapted the iconography of a Christian lamentation for this commemorative sheet commissioned by Karl Liebknecht's widow following his murder while in police custody. A leftist revolutionary, Liebknecht had been arrested along with Rosa Luxemburg for leading an uprising staged by the German Communist Party in Berlin in January 1919. Kolwitz portrayed a group of observers I'm sorry, a group of workers mourning over Liebknecht's body, and we know that they're workers from looking at their clothing, and she positions Liebknecht as a martyr. So she developed the print over a period of two years, exploring the theme and in etching, which we see on the left, and lithography before settling on woodcut on the right. And this is a transition that we're going to return to a, a couple more times as we look through the, the exhibition, thinking a little bit about why woodcut was such a good solution for Kolwitz um, at this moment. So she really embraced the direct effect of woodblock printing, and it suited the print's message of protest. And we see in the woodblock an enlarged cast of mourners compared with the etching, including a woman in, and child who stand towards the front of the group and bear witness to Liebknecht's death. And Kolwitz often highlighted the role of women in her work, a, a theme that runs throughout the exhibition. From the title wall, we move to the left side of the gallery and see three prints that show Kolwitz at the height of her technical experimentation with intaglio printmaking. And she built up each image over several states, layering different processes to achieve both tone and texture. And Kolwitz is really known as a perfectionist um, in her printmaking. So for example, Outbreak, which incorporates a cloth texture that she achieved by laying canvas over the plate 
the um, etching plate and then running it through the press. So the fabric process that we see in the materials in the description. And if you look, you can see it all over the print. You can see it in the sky and you can also see it in the ground. Um, this really distinctive weave. And then the central figure in this print represents Black Anna, the leader of a 1525 peasants uprising, which is the subject of Kolwitz's second print cycle, Peasants' War. This print was completed the same year as Outbreak and is among the most highly regarded works produced by Kolwitz. She modeled the child on her son, Peter. The artist's lifelong friend, Beata Bonus Jeep, was shocked when she saw the print in an exhibition. And so she recalled her reaction. A mother, animal-like, naked, the light-colored corpse of her dead child between her thigh bones and arms, seeks with her eyes, with her lips, with her breath, to swallow back into herself the disappearing life that once belonged to her womb. When I saw the sheep, by chance we had not heard from each other for a long while. In the exhibition, I suddenly found myself in front of the etching and turned quickly out of the room in order to compose myself. Can something have happened with little Peter that she could make something so dreadful? No, it was pure passion itself, the force sleeping contained in the mother animal that yielding itself to the eye is fixed here by Kate Kolwitz someone to whom it is given to reach beneath the ultimate veils. What a description of this image. Um, Peter was around seven years old when Kolwitz made the print, which turned out to be prophetic. He was killed 11 years later um, in World War I. So the next group of works mark moments of transition in Kolwitz's life and work. So the Benton collection includes several preparatory sketches like the charcoal sketch on the left. And it's a study for the print that we see on the right, unemployment. It's a wonderful opportunity to really understand how Kolwitz is working at this point in her career. Again, she is in really close contact with people who are especially involved um, and visiting her husband's clinic. And he was very, very much focused on uh, working with working class people. Um, so Kolwitz is listening to their stories and you know, not just kind of having people um, sit as models. And this is where she um, gets a lot of the inspiration for her, her work uh, during this time. Um, looking at the sketch, you know, you can kind of see how she has translated this into the print. Um, the man in the print is much more stylized. Um, he's so dark compared with uh, the, the family that makes up the rest of the image. And, you know, she's worked in so much white you can see that wonderful texture, all of the gray um, that gives us that sandpaper treatment. Um, and the print's beauty, as is so often the case with Kolwitz, um, really is belied by its subject matter. So, um, you know, this man can't sleep. Um, his family is asleep, but, you know, looking at his wife with her sunken cheeks, 
um, they're they're not doing so well, uh, you know, with with his um, his unemployment. So not being able to provide for his family really weighing on him in so many different ways um, in this this image. And then after 1909. Um, the artist relies less on making studies from life and her style starts to take on a, a greater simplicity. And we see that to a certain extent here. Um, Kolwitz's life changed in 1914 when Germany entered into World War I. And so Peter, her son, eagerly enlisted, uh, going against his father's wishes. And Colvitz contributed this print to a weekly four page broadsheet of artistic responses to the war. So originally titled Waiting, it was actually published with a new title, Fear. And while other early contributions to the broadsheet by mostly male artists, projected confidence in the military and a sense of duty to defend Germany, really the same impulses that inspired Peter to enlist. Kolwitz's print, you know, doesn't condemn war, but instead she sheds light on the experiences of women as they wait to hear news of their husbands and sons. And she learned of Peter's death Two, year, two days, sorry, after the publication of Fear. So Kolwitz's wartime experience prompted stylistic changes in her work. It also ushered in more overtly political engagement as her attitude about justifications for the conflict and her family's sacrifice shifted. So we're going to spend some time looking at this print cycle, war. And of this cycle, she wrote, no one will suppose that these seven moderately sized woodcuts represent many long years of work. And yet it is so. In them is my confrontation with that part of my life from 1914 to 1918. And these four years were hard to reckon with. So war is Kolwitz's third print cycle and her first series in woodcut. Earlier, we looked at just a couple of prints from her first two series. So here we are looking at her third series in its entirety. So the series is published in 1923. Um, she started working on it in 1918, the year that World War I ended. And unlike her previous print cycles, war is not based on historical events. It's not inspired by things that Kolwitz herself didn't witness and didn't experience. Um, instead, it depicts those affected by World War I, a contemporary event, not just soldiers, notably, but especially those on the home front. And when I teach with these prints in the museum, that's something that uh, I spend some time talking with students about, you know, what would they expect a print series titled War to, to look like? And, you know, how does, does this print cycle that we'll be exploring sort of compare with that? So Colvitz made prints for the series in etching and those etchings really don't survive. She was so dissatisfied them, with them that she destroyed most of them. Um, she also worked in lithography and will be exploring some of those lithographs. But then she finally chooses woodcut as the most appropriate print medium for her 
urgent, uh, really anti-war message. And that was Kolwitz's message that World War I should be the war to end all wars. And she hoped that an art that a, a series of artworks uh, like these would help to convey that message. So she really worked and reworked images in this series to make her personal experience universal. And I'll talk about just a couple of examples. So the sacrifice is the first sheet in the series, but it's actually the last print, the second to last print that she completed. And in all of her series, Colvitz tended not to um, create her prints from number one to the end. Um, she would actually make the different prints in the series and then put them in an order that um, sort of supplied her with a, a rough uh, narrative. So the penultimate print uh, first sheet um, and definitely one that very directly communicates uh, Kolwitz's feeling about war. So we see a naked woman eyes closed, who offers up her child. And a large pool of black spreads around her, you know, interrupted by these energetic lines that are then capped by more black ink. And Colvitz's mark making uh, lends emotion to an image that is on the one hand allegorical, and also autobiographical. And it, it really recalls for me, woman with dead child. Um, looking at these two works, we have the nudity that, you know, kind of takes the work, um, takes the image to a level of symbolism. Um, gives it a, 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 a sense of timelessness, um, also gives it a, a sense of, you know, just being totally without any indicators of class, for example. Um, so this choice that Colvitz is making in both of these images, you know, to kind of make us focus not on those details that she's so careful to include um, in some of her other works, but instead to really focus on the powerful emotions that are being conveyed in, in both of these images. And looking at these two together, I think also helps us to understand what a huge transition it was for Colvitz to start working in, in woodcut. Um, you can see very clearly her mark making on the left and on the right, I mean, the way that she is um, just kind of working and reworking her, her etching plate, um, there's a kind of finesse in what the work that we see on the right that that's really missing on the left and in place of that is more directness um, especially in terms of the the work's graphic quality um, which I think is very um, very intentional and you know this is something that it it really took her a couple of years of searching when she started this series to arrive at Woodcut. So um, the memorial sheet that we looked at, at from the title wall at the very beginning of the presentation, you know, it's another place where we can see that transition happening. So the second sheet in the series is the volunteers. And here, an allegory of death beats a drum 
and leads a line of young volunteers to their untimely demise on the battlefield. And again, Kolwitz includes a portrait of her son, Peter. He is the first soldier after death. And she also included three of his friends, all of whom died during the war. And so again, she's including this symbol of death. Um, you know, we, we have this skeleton um, kind of jumping here to the, the head of the line. Um, and this, this space again, where we have symbolism and naturalism, but symbolism may be pushed to an extreme. Um, in the volunteers, we're not in an actual space um, like we are in the print death um, on the right. Um, we can see again, this really energetic mark making. I mean, I, this is an interesting comparison to me because we still have so much black and we can see how she's using really dark tones in her earlier work and then um, taking that so much further in her woodcuts. So the third sheet in the series is the parents and we have two related prints in the exhibition. She modeled both of the prints you see here, the parents and also lonely man on her own mother and father. And in the early lithographic version of the parents, which we see on the right, the couple sit apart from each other and it's, it's their faces that convey emotion. Um, she's also exaggerated their hands, which, you know, kind of sit um, just in a, 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 an attitude of, of total defeat um, in, in their laps. And we can see between this print from 1919 on the right and then the left, the, the woodcut, she's made some significant changes. Um, the parents are here kneeling in an embrace. So conveying emotion um, in a, a, a really different way and in a way that is much more active. Um, their faces are covered. And so we don't, we don't see their emotions on their faces, but instead it's their bodies and especially their hands that express their grief. Um, and here the, the father's hands you know, are, are so much enlarged and also um, so central to this composition. Um, I could give a, a, a totally different talk where we would spend the whole time just talking about hands in Kolwitz's work. Um, because they're, they're so important. And, you know, you can see her really highlighting them um, all across uh, so many different prints. So this is the wall opposite and the charcoal drawing that we see all the way on the left end of the wall. And then the lithographic prints, um, they're all related to the fourth and the fifth sheets in Kolwitz's war cycle. And both of those sheets are titled Widow. And we'll just look at, at one of them. So the lithograph on the right um, presents a frontal view of a pregnant woman and her face is angled down and to the left. And again, the hands here um, kind of falling helplessly to her sides. Her palms are open. In the final woodcut, 
the woman is resting her right hand on her swollen belly and her head just drops to the side um, in this expression of grief. Um, here, not a lot of time is really separating the execution of um, these two works, but I, I love how in the lithograph, we can see um, these almost kind of sketchy lines that are coming off of the widow and um, give us an impression of her, um, you know, kind of moving, almost like she's making the same motions repeatedly. And then on the left, we have that same sort of idea of these marks outside of the, the image of the figure. But to me, they serve as a, a reminder once again of the effort that it took to sort of gouge all of that space out of the, the, the woodblock print. And it's, it's kind of seeing Kolwitz's mark making um, in, in a really different way. Kolwitz's work was used in leaflets, postcards, and posters throughout her career, but especially during the 1920s when she became more politically active. So at the height of her fame, the artist lent her instantly recognizable style to support a range of progressive causes including anti-war demonstrations and also international aid efforts. For example, in this print, two pairs of hands reach out towards an emaciated man, making literal the exhortation of the title, Help Russia. And the print was published as part of the relief efforts of Workers International Relief after a severe drought led to widespread famine in Soviet Russia. Kolwitz also supported causes closer to home, uh, creating this poster for a December 1922 temperance week in the Schoenberg borough of Berlin. Reflecting on the relationship between art and politics that same month, she wrote, let people say a thousand times that art with a purpose is not pure art. I, for my part, want to be effective with my art for as long as I am able to work. The final group of prints in the exhibition is Proletariat. Kolwitz's fourth print cycle and her second series in Woodcut. And again, we're seeing her series here presented in its entirety. So there's just uh, three prints. And each print in the series is dominated by dense fields of black. Uh, the figures appear to emerge out of darkness. And we see a family, a group of women and children, a skeleton, and finally a woman holding a child's coffin. So Kolwitz depicted these figures through radical simplification. And she's carving just enough of the block to give her subjects life. Um, this series especially has a really strong graphic impact and it's matched by the desperation of the workers and their families. This image, when we take some time to look at it, I mean, we can see how she's left so much of, um, of the block uncarved. Um, we have 
here, you know, again, some of the um, the images, kinds of images that we've seen before, um, the the child, um, two children, you know, one baby, the 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 mother's face um, with the the child kind of held up to her, um, almost ob obscuring part of her face. Um, and again, this this emphasis on the hands. Um, so uh, we have the the father um, with with his hand, you know, kind of up around his throat, and then a, another child um, sort of grasping a spoon um, with a, a look of you know just just horror and really misery, and. These are themes that you know we've we've seen before. Um, so both of these prints on this theme of unemployment, and we can see you know where Colvitz has taken her art, um, the way that she is using etching in the print on the right. I mean again that finesse that you know kind of beauty um in in her work and um on the left to a certain extent sacrificed a lot of that um to give us an image that is just so incredibly impactful the child uh, whose face we were just looking at um, really reminds me of the child that we see in death. Um, and with this pair, Colvitz has sort of gone from showing us death on the right um, early in her career to on the left, really highlighting the cause of death. So the title here that she's given is hunger. And again, we have that representation of death. So the skeleton that we have seen um, here and also in war um, is repeated. And you know, it's just this, this incredibly menacing figure um, that appears to be whipping this group of women and children um, in the lower part of the image. And in terms of dimensions, this is the, the largest print in the series, really the one that um, your eye is, is drawn to uh, first. This print is the only one in the exhibition that was not donated to the museum by Dr. Walter Landauer, a German expatriate and a professor of animal sciences who taught at UConn from 1924 to 1964. Professor Landauer was interested in the power of art to raise social consciousness and political awareness. And he built a collection of more than 100 works by Colvitz and donated it to the university upon his retirement. And so he wasn't able for whatever reason to find an impression of child mortality, the third sheet in proletariat uh, for his collection. Um, so this example was acquired by the Benton in his honor and it completed the set and then also allows the museum to represent all five of Colvitz's print cycles in their entirety. Um, a Weaver's Revolt, Peasant's War, War, Proletariat, and then also Death. And Death is the last of, um, of Colvitz's print cycles, which she completes in 1937. And it's, it's um, all lithographs, so not, uh, not woodcut. So great timing. Uh, I have 
sort of finished the walkthrough and I have a question from Bob Leo. Um, Bob asks, uh, great to see the Benton using works in the archives um, and is just asking how the exhibition was funded. Um, we didn't have any special funding for this particular exhibition. Um, the show actually came about um, in the last year, like many museums all around the world, the Benton had to adjust its exhibition schedule because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And we ended up shifting everything by one year. Um, it gave us a great opportunity really in the end um, to be able to share Colvitz's work. Um, we have this fantastic collection of Colvitz's art, um, thanks to Dr. Landauer's generosity. Um, and we, we hadn't had a, a one person presentation of her work since 2007. Um, so we really felt like it was a great moment um, to share, um, not only because it's such a highlight from the Benton's collection, but also perhaps because of the way that her work might resonate for people um, in our contemporary moment. Um, the, the kinds of issues that Colvitz was addressing and then also um, her, you know, political engagement. So she seemed like, uh, like a good choice um, for, for right now. So I'm happy to take other questions. Um, so Sarah Goodman asking how Colvitz's art can be repurposed to address economic justice in the, the present. I mean, I, I think this is a, a really great question um, and one that, um, that I'm not sure, you know, I can give a, a complete answer to. I mean, if anyone has a comment that they would like to make, um, you know, feel free to put it into uh, the Q&A and um, contribute to the, the conversation. Um, I, I think that with someone like Colvitz, um, this question from the perspective of, of artists today and also museums, um, I think trying to understand that question that I started um, the, the, the walkthrough with today, um, thinking a little bit about what the artist's role in society is. Um, and in, in many ways, you know, Colvitz is um, characterized as a, as a witness. And for a lot of her career, that's, that's really um, what, what she was. Um, and, you know, I've tried to focus on um, some of her works where I think she, um, you know, entered into uh, a, a sort of different place. She was pushed into a different place um, because of the war and because of, of those circumstances. And, you know, her work really changed a lot too. Um, I, I think also, um, you know, there, there's, there've been some other museums that have recently focused on Colvitz. And I think part of it um, really has to do with the, the way that, um, that she confronted these kinds of questions um, and, you know, perhaps um, might encourage other artists to um, also pay attention and to try to find ways to um, address issues, you know, like, um, like economic justice uh, today. Um, I mean, I think just by sharing Colvitz's work and, you know, particularly 
um, in in classes. I'm always thinking about teaching. You know, this this would be such such an amazing um, question for for discussion. So I have another question um, from Heather Golly. Um, are any of Colvitz's plates still in existence to your knowledge? You know, Colvitz's studio was um, lost during World War II and a huge amount of her work was destroyed. Um, so that's my best answer to that question um, regarding her, her actual plates. Um, I, I can also say that I know that her, um, her publishers and her dealer, um, they, they really printed and, and sold um, a, a lot of her work. Um, so there's, there's lots of, of different editions of her work that were made during her lifetime because her work was so popular. And, and she was popular in Europe, but she was also really popular in the United States as well, um, especially after she became um, kind of a target for uh, the Nazis. They didn't like Kolwitz. Um, they eventually stripped her of her place in the academy. Um, and, you know, the kind of, of really strong work that she was making um, was embraced in the United States um, as, you know, related to uh, this, these kinds of larger struggles um, ag against fascism. So other questions or comments um, that, that anyone has? So from Amy Moore, thanks. Thank you, Amy. Oh, from Imna Arroyo, great exhibition. Thanks so much, Imna. So a question from Irene Brown. Um, is there any connection between Colvitz and that of Durer? So this is a, a really great question. Um, Albrecht Durer, a uh, much earlier artist than Colvitz and you know, the artist who um, really makes woodcut into this amazing um, fine art form. Um, Durer experiences a revival um, in the early 20th century in Germany, artists are, you know, kind of looking back to his example. They're um, mostly artists who are associated with expressionism, um, looking for uh, the, these more sort of authentic ways of communicating. Um, I, you know, I, I, I feel like with, with Colvitz and Durer, um, it just makes me think of the way that she comes to woodcut. Um, she is, so it's, you know, 19, 19, 1920. It must be 1920. She's um, really frustrated with the work that she's making with this war cycle. And, you know, the etchings, the lithographs, they're just not working for her. So she goes to see and sees an exhibition by the German artist, Ernest Barlach. And he is exhibiting woodcuts. And she writes in her diary, um, he's really on to something and is inspired by his example um, to start exploring woodcuts. And then, you know, we've seen where that that takes her. Um, so I, I think that that's one connection um, that I can think of. And, you know, there there may very well be um, 
places that we can point to and say, you know, here's here's Colvitz um, really looking very directly at Durer. Um, I I see her looking very directly uh, at at Barlach. And you know, she's she's always such a curious artist um, to try to find her place because she's just she's not part of any of these larger movements that are happening um, around her either. Um, so, you know, she doesn't neatly fall into um, a lot of these categories. And, you know, if, if we weren't doing a walkthrough and we were doing um, a presentation where, you know, we'll, we would focus more on, on other artists, I mean, I think it's interesting to point out so much of the work that we're looking at, she's developing when abstraction is um, just uh, exploding in, in contemporary art um, in the, the first decades of the, the 20th century. And she just um, always stays with the, the human figure. So in the um, commenting, I can see her influence in American and Latin American printmaking. Um, you know, do you see those possible connections? Definitely. Um, I, I think because um, so much of Colvitz's work comes to the United States and is circulated, you know, really widely here and all over the, the world, um, that, that we, we definitely see her influence. Um, I, I think also artists who are interested in political art. And then certainly, I mean, I was earlier today sort of thinking about Sue Ko, and we have some works by um, Sue Ko in our collection that, you know, I, I'd like to have, have up at, at some point. And, you know, I was thinking of um, especially w women artists um, who, who might be, you know, looking at Colvitz um, in, in a specific way and for, um, for inspiration. So we have a, a couple of more minutes um, if anyone has any questions and, and I really do appreciate um, the, the comments um, of thanks and I appreciate um, so much all of you being here um, as, as well. Um, you know, during this time, it is um, great to still be able to share uh, the, the exhibitions that, um, that we have in the, the museum. Um, and I, I do want to mention that the, the Benton is open. Um, the exhibition is up. We opened to the public on Wednesday and we will be open um, all the way through uh, all the way through April 10th. So right up until um, Yukon spring break. Um, so, uh, I've, I've actually been kind of disappointed talking to my parents who are waiting for their second vaccine shots. Going to a museum is not on the top of their list uh, once they're fully vaccinated. But um, if you've been, you know, really not comfortable coming to campus, um, you know, we, we will be there when you are ready. Um, and I will definitely be sending out um, some surveys asking if people would like to have presentations like this continue after the pandemic in some way, because I know not everyone can make it over to the museum. So Imna, thanks so much um, for that comment. So we are... Um, pretty much out of time. Uh, from Jen um, Simoniello, um, I work in animal science. So when you mentioned Dr. Landauer, it was quite a surprise. Um, yeah, really great to be able to make those kinds of connections and to, you know, share especially um, that kind of 
of legacy of a, a faculty member um, with our community today. Um, so thank you all again. Uh, thank you for your thanks and um, we'll see you soon. <laughs>